invite your attention this morning to Luke 5. Good to have everybody uh, in the house together this morning. You may have uh, found someone in your seat this morning. I hope you were gracious. Thankful for those of you joining us online as well. While you're turning to Luke 5, let me mention what Curtis referred to a few moments ago, and that is our vision. If you haven't been around here in a while, or maybe you're new, just popped in this morning, um, our vision is the same as it was back in 1992 when we first relocated here, and that was to reach uh, primarily the I-30, 430 corridor. Um, our vision is still the same, just the methodology has changed, and our methodology now Um, Just to keep it real simple is we recognize that this is Walmart. This is big. Uh, A lot of people come here. It's full service. But there are people who don't like going to Walmart. So we're going to be planting a lot of uh, dollar generals uh, all out in the communities. That's our goal. Okay. Now, we were starting with our Raymar Road property about four, four and a half miles down the interstate here. And and uh, we have a large old home on that property that we wanted to convert to a ministry center. And we also needed to build an operations building for maintenance, storage, those kind of things. And so we needed about $550,000. We didn't feel led to do a building campaign for that amount. We just came to the church and said, hey, this is what we need. We've got a little bit of money in our building fund. We've got a very generous $100,000 gift that's already been given. So we needed the church um, on one Sunday, June 6th. No, June 6th was the vision day. June 27th, the last Sunday of June, we asked the church to bring the best offering that day to bring us $200,000 to complete um, that project. And the idea is that this will be reproducible. We'll do this, we'll get this started, then we're going to look for another area where people need to be reached. They're not going to come here, but we can go to them. Long story short, uh, to date, we have received, uh, for that $200,000 need, we've received $335,000 dollars has come in because of your faithfulness to give. (laughs) Excess funds, when we're uh, through completing this project, will stay in that building fund. Some of you, I know there's at least a couple of families that I could name that have given to the building fund for 50 years. Even when we're not building, they're given to the building fund. Keep doing it because we're going to replicate this process. We're going to continue to do the same thing over the next several years as we try to get in all the areas around us where people are not coming here, we're going to go to them, which is exactly what Jesus called us to do. All right, Luke chapter 5, let's read together the first 11 verses. We're looking at encounters with Jesus this summer. Week 1, we looked at the encounter of the man who uh, had so much he didn't know what to do with it, and rather than considering the work of the Lord and others around him, he built bigger barns and his soul was required of him. Last week... Who remembers what we looked at last week? What was it? The demon-possessed man. Thank you. The demon-possessed man. His encounter with Jesus. The man had over 2,000 demons, maybe as many as six in him, and uh, he met Jesus and was set free. Now, this week, we're looking at this third encounter, and this is the uh, encounter Jesus had with Simon. We also know him as Peter. I may use either name this morning and some of the other disciples that he was going to call. Luke chapter 5, verse 1. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. Same thing as the Sea of Galilee, just another name. There are three different names used in Scripture. So he was standing by the lake Gennesaret, or the Sea of Galilee. He saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, He asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we told all night and took nothing, but at your word I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching men. And when they brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Well, last week's encounter was on the far side of of the Sea of Galilee. This week's encounter is on the other side. Probably 
in the vicinity of Capernaum where um, Jesus often ministered. That was one of the towns on the lake. You saw that the crowds are large. They are large because Jesus has been around long enough now that he's become known or or gained fame as a uh, preacher and as a healer. So anywhere he went, large crowds would gather. And it says the crowds had pressed in so close that Jesus decides to use a fishing boat to preach from. Happened to be Simon's boat, one of the two that were there. Just out from Capernaum is a, is a place in the land that's kind of a natural uh, amphitheater. So it would be easy um, for a teacher, for Jesus, along the shore there to teach. And by pushing back from the crowd and also being in a boat on the water, his voice would carry much more easily. Now, to be sure, Jesus didn't need a boat to get on the water, did he? No, he could have just walked out there. Now, that might have blown the whole message. I don't know. They would have been distracted like a bunch of junior high boys, but he could have just walked out on the water. He could have taught from anywhere. So why did Jesus borrow the boat? He didn't borrow the boat so much for himself or for the crowd. Jesus borrowed the boat for these fishermen. He was choosing them. He was going to get them involved in his work. He was going to show them that he was the God of miracles in order to build their faith to trust him and to follow him because that's exactly what he was going to call them to do. You know, if you think about it, using a a fishing boat as as a pulpit is is both uh, figurative and suggestive. Every, Every pulpit is a fishing boat because from every pulpit, God would have us cast out the word of God and attempt to catch men. Now, of course, for that to happen, there have to be men and women here who need to be caught. You with me? Are you with me? Doesn't do any good to cast the net if there aren't fish that need to be caught. Jesus' use of of Simon's fishing boat here in Luke 5 reminds us that any time we put what we have at his disposal. And what do we have? We have what he's given us. He's given us possessions. He's given us talents. He's given us abilities. When we take those things and make them available, he's going to use whatever we have for his glory. And I say that because there are always some who are sitting, when we think about people that, that Jesus used greatly, there are some people that are sitting within their congregation and think, well, I don't have anything. No, we all have something because he has given us talents and abilities and possessions and things that we can use for his glory. Now look at verse 2. Here's something we could easily glance over and overlook. What were Simon and his brother Andrew? No, it doesn't mention Andrew in the text, but Andrew was a partner with Simon. These brothers fished together. What were Simon and Andrew and James and John doing? Look what it says in chapter 2. They'd gotten out of their boats and they were doing what? They were washing their nets. That didn't seem like a big deal. It's easy just to glance over that, but there's some important truths for us here. We know from the text that they had been out fishing all night. Now, that was not uncommon on the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is 690 feet below sea level. That means there's not a lot of, uh, of movement. There's not any kind of tidal flow to stir up the water. There's not a large amount of silt in the Sea of Galilee. So the water usually was very clear. Because the water was very clear, it was easy for the fish to see the nets, to see the boats. It wasn't uncommon for fishermen to go out and to uh, to fish at night. Well, it says they had been out all night, so we know they were tired. They'd not caught any fish, so we know they were frustrated. But if they'd not caught fish, why were they washing their nets? Because the nets, from all those attempts at catching fish, were full of weeds and sand and rocks and bits of shell and and even bits of dead stuff. You know what happens when a net is not washed? It stinks. When it's not washed, the net stinks, the boat stinks, anywhere the boat is docked, stinks. If the net's not washed, those cords that make up that net begin to rot, they become weakened, they tear, they're, they're unreliable. The nets become unreliable. So if the nets aren't clean, fishing becomes difficult. If the nets aren't clean, that that debris hinders the movement of the net. When they dropped the net in the water, because the water was so clear, the nets needed to be nearly invisible. They needed to very smoothly flow into the water, but the debris would prevent the movement or hinder the movement of the net, and the debris made it easy for the fish to spot the net and be frightened away. Now, I'm going to get back to this in a minute, but without dad explaining. Let me make the parallel to us and our responsibility. We, those who know Christ, are Christ followers. We're we're disciples. The same thing that Peter is being called to here, we are, are called to here as well. We're supposed to be fishers of men. 
And if that's going to happen, we have to make a regular habit and a regular practice of cleaning our nets. Consider that, that the sea would represent the world, the, the sea of humanity. The nets, our nets are our connection to the sea of humanity, our, our relationship to the world. And just like the nets used here, our nets accumulate all sorts of completely useless things that get in the way of us doing the, the task, accomplishing the, accomplishing the task that God has given us. You see, as we're in the world and we're supposed to be in the world, we're not supposed to be sequestered away, hiding from the world. We're supposed to be in the world, but as we're in the world, what happens in our lives is there are things we pick up that lessen our effectiveness. Maybe we pick them up from the internet, maybe from television, maybe from friends or from coworkers, but we accumulate some useless trash. And we pour that trash into our souls, and then we wonder as a believer why our life, why our effectiveness for Christ, why our ministry is hindered after we pour all that trash into our souls. We're not effective because our lives are hindered by junk. Junky thoughts, junky sentiments, junky attitudes, junky attachments. All this junk is in us, and we haven't washed our nets. And listen, when you don't wash your net, not only does your net stink, but you stink up the whole boat. You hear what I'm saying? You don't just affect your ministry. You affect the ministry of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ when you're known as a believer, as a follower of Christ, and you're walking around with a stinky net. Stop being a stinker. <laughs> it's important to regularly clean our nets, and I hope that picture of them cleaning their nets will be one that will uh, resonate with you and come to your mind often. Look at verse 4. It says, when Jesus finished teaching, he asked to go fishing. He asked Simon to let down the nets, to put the nets back in the water. Now, they're tired. They've been out all night. They're, they're frustrated. They're ready to get away from the stinking lake and, and head home. What, what's going to happen if they put nets back in the water? They're just going to get dirty again. Who knows what thoughts might have been going through their heads. And notice Jesus says that he wants them to go out into the deep. You know, they didn't have motors on their boats back then. You know how they got out through the deep? They had to row. So here's these tired, frustrated men. Jesus asked them, Take, let's go out to the deep, deep and let's cast out the nets. You know, our natural instinct is, is to crave the shallows. It's a lot more comfortable. It's a lot less scary. It's a whole lot less work. But Jesus calls us out into the deep where it's not comfortable, but he always has a good reason for that, doesn't he? And so they go out. You know, knowing what we know about Simon Peter, it's amazing how polite his response is there in verse 5. Well, we've already fished this area and caught nothing, but, or nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the nets. You know, there's a lot more that Simon could have said, but he has great respect for Jesus. This is not the first time they've met. His, his calling was kind of a process. And out of his respect for Jesus, he was willing to go out and to let down the nets. But, you know, you have to wonder, if that had been me or you in that situation, what, what might we have said? I mean, I don't know about you. you. You probably never do this, but from time to time, I argue with the Lord. I think if that had been me and Jesus said, let's go out, I'd said, Lord, listen, there's nothing out there. I, I know, I, I just tried. Lord, I'm tired. I need some rest. Lord, we just finished cleaning all the equipment. How about we wait till tomorrow? Lord, listen, no one else caught anything either. Hey, Jim, Bob, you guys catch anything? Nope, see? No one caught anything. Lord, you're a carpenter. I'm a fisherman. How often do we tell the Lord or at least intimate in the way we act and respond that we know better than he does? Well, we often make fun of Simon. He's impetuous. He's the mouthy disciple. But here's one way we should be more like him. Simon is tired. He's worn out. He's frustrated, but he acts in obedient faith. Lord, we've been out all night, hadn't caught anything, but at your word, we'll let down the nets. And you notice Jesus doesn't give a, a reason or explanation here. That would have made it a little bit simpler. If he just said, hey, guys, come over here, look at the depth finder. There's a school of fish right over here. He didn't say that. By the way, you guys that are fishermen, uh, you would know and understand Jesus has a built-in live scope, okay? He didn't need a depth finder to look at. But he didn't tell them, hey, there's a school of fish out here. He just said, look what he said, let down the nets for a 
catch. You just say, let down the nets. And they trusted him and they trusted his word and they had faith. Now, I'm not saying they had great faith. Clearly, they weren't expecting a miraculous catch. But when you obey the Lord, it always results in miraculous. When Jesus gives direction, though, it's imperative that we do exactly what we're told to do. You know, I usually wait and give applications at the end of the message, but let me, let me just pause right here and give you one application right now. It's just five words. These five words were spoken by Mary, Jesus' mother, at the wedding in Cana when they ran uh, out of wine at that wedding. She spoke these words to the master of the banquet at the wedding feast, and these were the words, do whatever he tells you. You remember that story? They're out of wine at this banquet. They're kind of in a panic. That's a horrible thing in this culture, in this setting. And Jesus' mother says, hey, do what he tells you to do. What does he tell them to do? He says, those six jars over there, I want you to fill them with water. Those six jars were pots that would hold 20 to 30 gallons each. And he said, I need you to fill those six jars with water. Now, the master of the banquet would have given word to the servants who were serving there to fill the six jars with water. And I can just imagine some of those servants muttering, this is dumb. This makes no sense. But what happens when the six jars are filled? Jesus miraculously turns that water into wine. Listen, if you want to see the hand of God, you need to listen. You need to hear the voice of God. If you want to see the hand of God, you need to listen. You need to hear the voice of God. And let me make sure you're clear when I say hear. When Jesus would talk about hearing Frequently, the Greek word, most often the Greek word used there meant to listen with intent to obey. If you want to see the hand of God, you need to hear, you need to obey the voice of God. And if you look in the New Testament over and over and over again, you see Jesus bringing glory to the Father, bringing glory to himself when people were obedient first. Let's just walk through the Gospel of John very quickly. John chapter 6, the 5,000 have gathered. They're hungry. There's nowhere nearby to get food. The disciples come to him. What do we do? And, and they find there's a boy that has five loaves and two fish for 5,000 men plus women and children. And Jesus says to the disciples, have the crowd sit down. Now, I imagine, where did John and Tyler go? There you guys are. I imagine in that group of disciples, there's probably at least one worship leader. And he's thinking, you know, people get frustrated when you have them sit down and get up. You're going to tell them to sit down, then there's no food. They have to get up and go get food. They're probably worried about that. But Jesus doesn't perform the miracle. He doesn't multiply the five loaves and two fish until they've obeyed his command and told the crowd or made the crowd, made the people sit down. John chapter 9, the man born blind, the man who was blind from birth. You remember Jesus and the disciples had that exchange. Well, who sinned, this, this man or his parents? No, this is for the glory of God. Jesus tells the man, while the man is still blind, he tells the man, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. What if the man had not gone as Jesus instructed and washed in the pool of Siloam? He would not only have been born blind, he would have died blind. But he obeyed Jesus' command without knowing what that was going to lead to. John chapter 11, verse 39, Jesus comes, Lazarus has died, he intentionally waited, Lazarus had been in the grave long enough that his sweet sister said, he stinks. But when Jesus comes without telling them what he's going to do, he tells them to remove the stone. And after they removed the stone, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. What about the end of John? John chapter 21, the other miraculous catch of fish. The disciples had once again been out and caught nothing. And he simply told them, cast your net on the other side. And they brought in 153 fish. By the way, it's interesting that these disciples were fishermen by trade. And the only time we ever know of them catching fish is when Jesus performed a miracle for them. Not sure they were too good at it. But the point is, Jesus continually would give an instruction, and after obedience, you would see the hand of God. If you want to see the hand of God, you need to hear and obey the voice of God. They did. Look at verses 6 and 7. There's this miraculous catch of fish. The nets are breaking. The boats are sinking. They had success. Why? Because he followed the Lord's instruction. He doesn't always give a reason. He doesn't have to give a reason. He doesn't have to explain it. If we're going to follow him and do his work, we have to do it the way he tells us to do it. We can't do it our way. 
In fact, we need to remember that on our own, we don't have the power, we don't have the ability to do the work. What did Jesus say in John uh, chapter 15 when he talked about the vine and the branches? Apart from me, you can do what? Nothing. When the branch is cut off from the vine, it's absolutely useless. It's not going to produce any fruit. It's going to shrivel up and die. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. And so we have to do it his way. We have to do it in his power. We have to obey what he tells us to do, even when there's no explanation. Look in verse 8. Look at Simon's response after this miraculous catch. It says that he recognized he was in the presence of the holy God. He confesses he's a, a man who's a sinner. He's committed unrighteous acts. And now as a man who's a sinner and unrighteous, he's in the company of pure righteousness, the only righteous one. And his response is so interesting. It's just like the response of the, of the uh, people of the town last week. His response is, depart from me. Different reason, though. Depart from me. Why? Because he doesn't feel worthy enough to be with the Lord. He can't imagine why Jesus would want to hang out with him. But I want you to notice in Peter's response, a couple of things happened. One is he confessed sin, and two is he declared that Jesus is Lord. That is an example of what happens in a person's life when they come to faith in Christ. Simon said, I'm a sinner, and he called Jesus Lord. You know, when we really understand our own heart and comprehend the depth of, of our own depravity and our unworthiness, we should be speechlessly amazed at the goodness and grace and love of God for us. And the appropriate response when we recognize God's goodness and grace and love for us is to confess our sin and make Jesus Lord. And you may be here this morning, and that's never happened. Maybe you've been in church all your life, and that's never happened. The appropriate response when we understand what Christ has done for us on that cross, we understand that while we were yet sinners, God sent Christ to die for us. The appropriate response when we see the goodness and grace and love for God is to confess, God, I am a sinner, but you are Lord and you are my Lord. That's how we respond. Now look at Jesus' response in verse 10. Don't be afraid. What's he saying? Simon, I know you. I know about your sin, your unrighteousness. I, I, I know what you're like. I know what the stuff you're made of. But I see what you can become. And what does he say? I, I want you to follow me. Now, what, what does Jesus mean when he calls Simon and the others to, to follow him? Well, here in verse 10 it says they're going to be fishing for or, or catching men. They could not have possibly understood um, all that that meant. But this miracle that they had just been a part of gave them the courage to trust him with their lives. What did it say in verse 11? They left everything. They left their families, their friends, their livelihoods to go with him and, and to do his work. But he wasn't just calling them to do the ministry and to do the work. Remember, apart from his presence, our efforts are worthless as individuals and as a church. If we don't have God's presence, if we don't have his vision, if he hasn't called us and we're not following, we're not being obedient to exactly what he's called us to do, then our efforts are worthless. So it's not just about doing the work. In fact, over in Mark 3.14, and you, you won't have time to turn there, you can look it up later, but in Mark 3.14, you see an even more clear explanation of the call on these men's lives. Here's what it says in Mark 3.14. He appointed 12, listen, that they might be with him, that he might send them out to preach, and that they would have authority to drive out demons. So he plans to give them ministry, but what does he first call them to? To be with him. That's the priority. Before any ministry takes place, before he can use us, we have to be with him. What does that mean? It means to spend time with him means to hear his word, to spend time in his word, to, to meditate on what the word says, to talk to him, just to be in his presence. He called them not just to fish for men, but before they could do that, they had to be with him. To be with him means that we're, we're, we're separated from the world, from the crowd, and we're in constant and, and continuous association with him. That's what it means to be with him. That's what he's, he's calling them to. Now, the reason I wanted to cover this encounter today, the reason this encounter is important is because the calling of Simon is our calling. No, God's probably not calling you to, to lead the church in some way like Simon did. God's probably not calling most of us in this room to preach before a crowd and have 3,000 people come to Christ. But he's calling us to follow him and to be disciples. 
Now let's recap what that means, what we understand from this passage. First of all, we're called to be with him. To spend time in his presence, to spend time in his word, to spend time in prayer. We're called to join him in ministry. But if we join him in ministry, that includes unquestioning obedience to whatever he says. And it may be a huge step of faith. It may at some times seem tiresome or seem unnecessary, but he calls us to obedience in all the things that he speaks to us. Let me give you three keys to remember. I've already given you one good application to do what he says. Let me give you three keys to remember this morning. The first is this. God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. Simon Peter was a fisherman. It's all he knew. It's his whole life. It's what he grew up in. It was his livelihood, his trade. It's what his family did. He was just an ordinary fisherman. He had nothing to offer. His own confession was he was an unrighteous man, a sinful man, but he was called to do extraordinary things. Look at his life. Called to do extraordinary things. Listen, God doesn't need us to help him. He wants us. Doesn't that change the whole perspective? God doesn't need us to do anything. He can do it all. But he wants us to have the privilege and the opportunity of joining him in his work. And I don't care who you are here today or how ordinary you think you are. God uses ordinary people, calls ordinary people to do extraordinary things. The the second thing goes right along with that. Every one of us has gifts and talents that are given by God. And when we make those things available to him, then he will use those things to bring honor and glory to himself and also to expand the kingdom, to further the kingdom. So no one in this room is too ordinary to be used by God. No one in this room can say, well, I don't really have anything that God can use. God uses ordinary people and God gives each of us gifts and talents that he can use. But here's the third thing, and that is this. The work is not always easy but it is incredibly rewarding. It's not fun to have to sit around and and, and clean the nets. There's a lot of times that there's a lot of long nights without any apparent progress. That long night may be more than one night. It could be months or years of hard toil and no apparent progress. But we just have to trust the Lord if we're doing what he's called us to do. It's tiresome. It's difficult. Sometimes it's frustrating. And we have to remain, in in all of that frustration and tiredness, we have to remain dedicated to Jesus, obeying and trusting him in whatever he says. Listen, remember, Simon Peter, we we think about Simon Peter as the guy who preached at Pentecost and 3,000 were saved and as the guy who who, um, was the head of the New Testament church. But before that, that was all happening in his life because the power of God was at work in him, not because he had the ability to make those things happen. Before that, he was just a fisherman with stinky nets that had to be washed that sometimes spent all night out and and saw nothing accomplished. But at the point that he confessed his sin, he made Jesus Lord, he left everything and followed him, he completely obeyed what he was told to do. At that point, Simon Peter became an extraordinary man, and it wasn't because he was extraordinary, it was because an extraordinary God was working through him. What kind of life you want to live? It's ordinary, ho-hum, going through the motions, 8 to 5, Monday through Friday. Do you want to live an extraordinary life? Spiritually. What's he called you to? Maybe you're not listening. If you want to see the hand of God, you've got to hear his voice and obey. 